Jonathan Edwards was a prolific author and an instrumental figure in the revivals of the 18th century known as the Great Awakenings. Just to give you an idea of what those revivals were like, 25% of the population in New England, that is the colonies, the new colonies in the United States, 25% of the population was converted to Christ in a four-year span. Just think about what that would be like in Canada. I think our population is around 35, 36 million. I don't know what 25% of that is, but it's a lot. To be converted in four years would be phenomenal. And Edwards was right in the middle of all that. He was the son and grandson of pastors. And after a couple of years in ministry, he came to Northampton, Massachusetts, where he came to assist his grandfather, a man by the name of Solomon Stoddard, who pastored the congregation there in New Hampton for 60 years. That's phenomenal. When you uh, think today that the average expectancy, the average ministry length of a pastor in a church is less than four. He was there for 60. When his grandfather died in 1729, Edwards became the pastor of the church, and he would remain there for 22 years. And during his ministry there, significant numbers of people were genuinely converted to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Both in 1734, there was a revival within the town of New Hampton, and then there was another period in the early 1740s in which a great number of people also came to know the Lord, both in New Hampton and all through the colonies of America and in Great Britain as well. If you know your church history a little bit, if you know that period at all, you'll know that George Whitfield was the greatest preacher of the period. I don't think many people would dispute that. But most people would agree that Edwards was the greatest theologian of his day. During the revival periods, Edwards would regularly have people lined up at his door on Monday morning. 30, 40, 50 people would be lined up outside the pastor's house with great concern for their souls as they were seeking pastoral direction for their life. He wrote, uh, he wrote extensively during those years, helping people to understand what genuine conversion really was, what it really looked like. Rather than just religion or religious emotionalism, what does genuine conversion like? Edwards wrote heavily on that, helping people to understand that. And he still remains today, for many people, a most influential theologian. Despite his wisdom, despite his preaching, despite his writing, and the enormous blessing that God poured out on his ministry, he was fired from his church after 22 years of serving them. The main issue of contention had to do with the Lord's Supper. You see, when his grandfather, Solomon Stoddard, had pastored the church for 60 years, he came to the conclusion that communion, partaking in the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper, was a converting ordinance. And so he opened the table to unbelievers thinking that by participating in communion, they would come to know the Lord. Well, Edwards rightly saw, I think, that this was an unbiblical, it was an unbiblical practice, and he further believed that having labored in the Word in his congregation for 22 years, that the congregation would see it his way. When, however, he began to refuse the table to unbelievers, it created an uproar in the church. Now, if you read his biography, you'll know that there were other problems that people had with Edwards, but that was the main issue of not letting people, in, in, not letting people partake in the Lord's Supper unless they were believers. And so there was a great uproar in the church, and a vote of confidence was called. And Edwards thought that after 22 years, people would vote with him, but when the votes were cast, only 10% of the congregation voted to support the pastor, and he was dismissed. 
Edwards had thought that the vast majority of the congregation would support him, but instead he was fired. Now I know that I'm the pastor of the church, you're not the pastor, but just imagine how you would feel for a moment. We know that Edwards had a deep affection for his congregation. These were people he loved. How would you feel going home after that meeting? Well, Edwards graciously accepted the decision of the church, and he returned home not embittered towards his congregation. Interestingly enough, those who voted against their pastor had made a slight oversight in dismissing him because they had failed to line up a replacement speaker for the following Sunday. Guess who they asked? (laughs) To come and preach. They asked Edwards. And he graciously agreed to come and fill the pulpit. And not only did he fill the pulpit on that Sunday, but there were several Sundays over the course of the next months, and I think it went on for almost a year, where they would regularly come to ask their fired pastor to preach. A wonderful historian by the name of Michael Haken notes that he genuinely loved his congregation, and during that period when he filled the pulpit all those times, he never once brought up the subject of his dismissal. He never once was embittered towards the congregation. I think we can all agree that that is a remarkable display of Christ-like character. When I look at the example of Christians like Edwards, I think to myself, this is how we're supposed to respond as believers. This is what it means. This is where the rubber meets the road, as it were, of being a Christian. But at the same time, I recognize that it's rare to see this kind of character in the church. And that should concern us. If that's the way it's supposed to be, if we can look at an example like that and say, yes, that is Christian character, that's the way it's supposed to be, but it isn't, that should concern us. Last week we looked at the subject of killing sin in our lives, and there is a second part to that equation that we're going to look at this morning in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. We need to be putting sin to death in our life. That is, we need to be getting rid of it. But the second part to the equation is we need to be also taking on the character traits of Christ. These verses talk to us about Christian character and they give us four important aspects of Christian character. Here's the first. Christian character is determined by Christian identity. The temperament of followers of Jesus is a result of who we are in Christ. Christian character is determined by Christian identity. Identity. Again, here in verse 12, we see the word therefore, which is connecting what has been said which is, which, with what is about to be said. You'll remember from last week in verses 5 through 11, we're told to be putting to death our sinful nature and to be renewed in Christ. And with that in mind, he writes this in the first half of verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, Holy and dearly loved. That's who we are. So before he gives us the command, he tells us what our identity is in Christ. He has told us what we are not to be like in verses 5 through 11. We're not to be, go back there into verse 5, we're not to be involved in sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. 
And then you go down a little farther. We're to rid ourselves in verse 8 of anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language. These are what we're not supposed to be. But before he tells us what we're supposed to be like, the, the character traits that we're supposed to have, he tells us who we are in Christ. He says we are chosen, holy, and dearly loved. The way Paul phrases that, there are strong parallels between how he is describing believers, the church here, with how Israel is described in the Old Testament. Repeatedly, you find in the Old Testament, as God refers to His chosen people, rather, as He refers to the people of Israel, He refers to them as His chosen people. That He chose them out of all the nations in the world, He chose Israel to belong to Him. We see that when he calls Abraham. He chooses Abraham. Out of all the people on the face that were living on the face of the earth at the time, he chooses Abraham and says, come to a land that I'll show you and I'll give it to you. We see that a little bit later on in the book of Genesis when God chooses Jacob over Esau. You remember the twin boys of Isaac and Rebekah? He chooses. God makes a conscious choice to choose Jacob over Esau. We see it when He brings the people of Israel after they've been in slavery in Egypt for 400 years. He he calls them His chosen people and He brings them out of Egypt. He delivers them. We might think that there's something particularly special about the nation of Israel and that's why God chose them. You know, because... Because Israel was just a cut above than everybody else, and that's why God chooses these people. But the Bible's description is quite opposite. It's not because they were numerous or they were powerful, Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 and 8. It's not because they were good people. In fact, God clearly calls them not good people in Deuteronomy 9, verse 5. It's not because God needs them. God doesn't need anything, according to Exodus 3.14 and Psalm 50 has nothing to do with them. God chooses His people based on His own sovereign power and unsearchable wisdom for the sake of His glory. According to Isaiah 48 and Ezekiel 20. And the same is true for those who belong to Christ. God the Holy Spirit awakens our hearts to the truth of the Gospel by His sovereign power according to His unsearchable wisdom for the, sake of His, for the sake of His eternal glory. If you doubt that, just jot this verse down. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4-6. through 6. I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to do this. Let's turn back there just a few pages. These are wonderful verses. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In his love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of His glorious grace which He has freely given us in the One He loves. God chooses His people according to His sovereign power and according to His unsearchable wisdom for the sake of His glory. If you believe the Gospel this morning, if you know that you're a sinner, and you can't earn your way to God's favor. And you've repented of your sin. And you've looked to the cross of Christ and to the empty tomb as the only means by which you're made right with God. If you believe that this morning in your heart of hearts, then you are chosen by God. And in being chosen by God, we are also chosen for God. Right? That's what it says here. Go back to Colossians 3. You are chosen people. The second thing he says about us is that we're holy. The word holy means to be set apart for the Lord. You're chosen by God and you're chosen for 
God. Finally, we're told here that those who are in Christ are dearly loved. If you go back and you look at the Old Testament, when God talks about the people of Israel being His chosen people, it often links another phrase, chosen and a treasured possession. Those who have been ransomed from the eternal wrath of God by faith in the blood of Christ are objects of His eternal love. That's who you are in Christ. That's your identity in Christ. And that should have a dramatic impact on the things that we do. Whenever I meet somebody new, I don't know if you do this, but whenever I meet somebody new, I will often ask them the question as I try to find things out about them, I'll often ask them the question, what do you do for a living? And whenever people answer that question, or I should say most often when people answer that question, what do you do for a living? No one ever answers, I do the work of a doctor. I do the work of an auto mechanic. I do the work of a construction worker. I do the work of a lawyer. Or I do the work of a dentist. Instead, when I ask the question of what do you do, do you know what people say? They say, I am a doctor. I am a lawyer. I am an auto mechanic. I am a construction worker. Isn't that an interesting way to answer the question, what do you do? We don't answer the question, I do this. We answer the question, I am. And what What we're understanding when we answer the question like that, what we're understanding is that how we identify ourselves affects what we do. If you are sick, you don't go to the auto mechanic. <laughs> right? That's a bad idea. You, where do you go? You go to the doctor. In the same way that being a doctor comes with the expectation of being able to help people feel better, being a Christian, being identified as being in Christ, comes with the expectation of, certain, of a certain kind of character. It's going to define what we do as people. And I would submit to you this morning that exhibiting Christian character is impossible if you do not keep at the forefront of your minds who you are in Christ. In order to foster the things that define Christian character, we need to regularly remind ourselves of who we are in Christ. You're chosen, holy, and dearly loved. Knowing who we are dramatically affects what we do. With that in our minds, we're ready to hear what the traits of Christian character are, or at least some of them. These are directly tied to the things we are commanded to put to death in verses 5-11. through You see, you need more in your life than simply to get rid of sin. Sinful actions, thoughts, and feelings need to be replaced with godly ones. That's what we see here in regards to Christian character. This is the second thing that our text has to say to us. It's that Christian character counteracts the sinful nature. A powerful weapon in the fight to put our sin to death is a conscious effort to take on the traits of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christian character counteracts the sinful nature. Here's the command based on our identity in verse 12, in the second half of verse 12. I'll just read all of verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. That's the command. Put these things on. Make these things part of who you are. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. There are five qualities listed here, and some commentators have have highlighted that there are also, if you go back in verses 5-11, through the sinless that are given come in lists of five. 
And the reason why Paul, some commentators think, the reason, and I think they're right, the reason why Paul gives the list of five things is the idea to see that these five things, these character traits of Christ, counteract the sinful nature, counteract the sinful deeds that we do. There is no such thing, listen to this carefully, there is no such thing as a void when it comes to our temperaments, when it comes to our character. Getting rid of anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language, that is a good thing, and we need to be working on getting rid of those things. But if we do get rid of those things, we do not become emotionless robots. Like just a picture of nothingness, like an opaque canvas. That's not what happens. Because as you get rid of those things, as you get rid of malice and rage and anger and slanders, you get rid of those things, you also need to be taking on holiness. There's no such thing as a spiritual void in the life of the Christian. In getting rid of anger, we're told here to take on, put on, compassion. This translates a Greek phrase which literally is, would be translated intestines of mercy. That's what the word compassion translates. You ever, you ever uh, have that feeling in your stomach? Like, you know, I felt it in my guts. Or I had a gut feeling. We still kind of use that terminology. That's how the Greek people thought of emotions. The deepest parts of your emotional being were in your belly. That's why you see here intestines of mercy. It's the idea of your innermost feelings. It's a way of saying you need to be genuinely concerned about other people in the depths of who you are. That's what it means to clothe yourselves with compassion. You read the Gospels and you find the phrase many, many times, and Jesus had compassion on them. Next, we're called to kindness. The word kindness here has the idea of acting rightly towards other people. You know, we know exactly most of the time how we should act in order to treat others rightly. We just need to ask ourselves, how would I like to be treated? I do that with my children all the time when they do something mean to their siblings. I say, now how would you feel if, you, if someone did that to you? And they, always, they almost always have the right answer. I would feel bad. That was wrong. We almost always have the right answer in terms of how to act rightly towards each other. But I would just caution you here, this does not mean, being kind to others does not mean enabling sin. But rather, it is caring for the good of others. It is doing right towards them. That's the heart of the Word. In addition to these things, we're told here to put on humility. That's another word that's easily misunderstood. We often associate, maybe you don't make this mistake, I make this mistake, I often associate humility in my mind with thinking badly or thinking poorly about myself. And I, I equate thinking negatively about myself with humility, but that misses the point of what humility is. To translate the word, it would mean something to the effect of being unselfish. In other words... To be humble, to be truly humble, is to not think about yourself at all. That's what it means to be humble. He then adds gentleness, which again can be taken the wrong way. Gentleness is not weakness. Tell me, who who had more power, who had more strength in all of human history than Jesus? Jesus. He had the power to calm the raging storm as he and his disciples were out on the Sea of Galilee. But his demeanor allowed for little children to be drawn to him and to receive his blessing. We need to be gentle. Finally, he says, here's a tough one. He says we need to put on patience. I love how the Freiburg Greek lexicon 
sorry, that's a dictionary, how the Freiburg Greek Dictionary defines this word. It says, patience is a state of emotional quietness in the face of unfavorable circumstances. I love that. I'll read that one again. Patience is a state of emotional quietness in the face of unfavorable circumstances. To put it another way, patience is remaining calm when things don't go your way. These things, the things that are mentioned here, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, these things are powerful weapons against sin. The sin that remains in our hearts. Because as we put these things on, as we take these character traits into our hearts, sin gets pushed out. When we went to Africa, the couple of times we went to Africa, it's amazing uh, how much of nature, things in nature in Africa are trying to kill you. I mean, it seems like everything in the country is trying to put an end to you. Do you know what the most dangerous animal in Africa is? That's number two. Hippo's number two. Giraffe is not, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's an inside joke. I'll tell you, if you didn't get that joke, I'll tell you about it later. It's not a giraffe. Thank you. Mosquitoes, somebody said it. Mosquitoes. Kills the most people in Africa every year. Number two is hippos. Uh, then you have alligators, spiders, and on down the list. The most vivid one for me, and maybe this is just because I don't like them very much, but the most vivid one for me was snakes. I was having lunch with uh, one of the doctors. His, his name was John. I was having lunch with him one day, and he was talking to me about snake bites. And he said, look, if you get bit by this kind of snake, there's nothing we can do for you. You're just done. I said, well, that's encouraging. Thanks, John. <laughs> and I said, well, what about, the, what about the snakes that you can get bit by and still be okay? He says, and he gave me a timeline. I... I forget what the timeline. It wasn't very long where you needed to get to the hospital. And when you get to the hospital, they, have, they, they store in, in the hospital where we were, they store anti-venom in the hospital. And they'll give you a, a shot of it. And what that does is it counteracts the effects of the snake bite. It counteracts the effects of the poisonous venom flowing through your body. That's how Christian character works in the life of a believer. It acts like anti-venom. The sin that comes from our sinful nature is like poison to our souls, killing us. And these qualities which come to us by God's grace through faith in Christ counteract those qualities of our sin nature. Do you want to fight? Do you have a problem with anger? Do you want to fight against anger? Focus on being compassionate. Do you want to get rid of rage? Do you find you have a problem with, with blowing your top all the time? Focus on being kind. Do you want to get rid of malice? Having hateful, a hateful attitude towards other people? Focus on being humble. That is, stop thinking about yourself. Be humble. Do you want to get rid of slander? Focus on taking on gentleness. Do you want to tame your tongue? Take on patience. Desiring to put sin to death in our lives is a very good thing, but sin also needs to be replaced by holiness because there's no such thing as a spiritual void of nothingness. Your soul, your mind, is going to be filled with something if you put sin to death and you don't replace it with holiness, then another sin will take its place or the same sin will come back. You cannot have a void in your soul. It needs to be filled with something. That's why we need to take on Christian character. This is true of our faith as individuals, but it's also essential to our life as a congregation, as a local group of believers. Believers. 
If I was to go around the room this morning and ask the question, do you want to be in a closer relationship with other people in this church? As good Sunday school people, you would all know that the right answer is yes to that question. I hope that many of you, most of you, would say yes. But if that is the true longing of our hearts to have a closer relationship with one another, then we need to give our attention to what is said here in verse 13. Here's the third thing about Christian character. Christian character preserves Christian relationship. In order for a local church to experience the kind of friendship that the Bible calls Christians to, its members need to follow Jesus' example. We need to have the character traits of Christ because Christian character preserves Christian relationship. We're all called to two things in verse 13. Listen to what we're called to here. Bear with each other. And forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Both of these things require the virtues that were given in verse 12. There's no way we're going to bear with each other. There's no way we're going to forgive each other unless we're taking on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That's what we're called to do here. We're called to bear with one another. Most of us, most human beings, tend to gravitate towards people who look like us, who think like us, who enjoy the same things that we do. That's how we tend to form our circle of friendships. But the church is not made up of people of our choosing. You're chosen, right? That was our identity in Christ. You're chosen. By who? By God. The church is not made up of people of my choosing or your choosing. The church is made up of people of God's choosing, which means that there are going to be people who have different personalities, different cultures, different languages, etc. There are are going to be people in the church that act in ways that don't naturally suit us. And so we're told to bear with one another. You could translate that literally as Put up with each other. That's what it means. If we don't bear with one another, if we don't put up with one another, we're no better than unbelievers. What do unbelievers do when they come into a relational conflict with somebody who doesn't quite match their personality set? Well, they just don't spend any time with them. Right? They're just not friends. And if that's how we act in the church, how are we any better than unbelievers? We're not. Bearing with one another is a distinctly Christian trait. It is more than simply putting up with personalities that we may find difficult, though. We also need, this is the second part, we also need to be willing to forgive, we're told here, whatever grievances we may have against each other. The idea of forgiveness implies that a genuine wrong has been committed against us. If you are angry with someone simply because you didn't get your way, you need to be asking for forgiveness, not offering forgiveness. The idea of needing forgiveness is that there's a genuine wrong. There's a legitimate complaint that you have against a brother or sister in Christ. There are a few different Greek words that translate the idea of forgiveness. And this one here is one of my favorites. It's the idea of giving or offering grace. Grace is giving kindness, showing favor to someone even though they don't deserve it. Some of you might be sitting here thinking, I can't forgive someone because they don't deserve it. Do you have any idea what they did to me? Do you have any idea how many times they've done it to me? Well, that's just the point of grace. 
They don't deserve it at all. Not even a little bit. The point's made abundantly clear here when the apostle says to us, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Now jump back for a moment to chapter 2, verse 13, just so we're clear on this. Chapter 2, verse 13 in Colossians. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave... Say it together. That was sad. Say it again. That was a little better. He forgave all our sins. Where would we be if when we repented and believed on the work of Christ, God forgave all of our sins except one? Where would we be? We'd be lost forever. Praise God. He forgives us all of our sins according to our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you also to think about this. I want you to keep this in mind, that it cost God incomparably more to forgive you and me than it does for us to forgive one another. God put the penalty of our sin as individuals and collectively, I I can't even fathom the quantities here, He put all of our sin, the penalty of our sin, on Christ. Now, God does not hate the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't feel indifferent about the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves the Son with an infinite, eternal love. God gave up His Son for you. None of us have to do that to forgive one another. I don't don't have to give up one of my children to forgive you. You don't have to give up a child to forgive me. God paid infinitely more to forgive us than we have to pay to forgive one another. And we need to forgive one another because we're still struggling with sin. Any perfect people here? If you put up your hand, you immediately lost your perfection. We still sin, right? We, we say things that we shouldn't say. We do things that we shouldn't do. We wound people. We destroy trust. We still struggle with sin. And if we don't bear with one another, if we don't forgive one another, then our relationships fall apart. Do you know that there's billions of the people in the world that live without a refrigerator? And did you know that for the vast majority of human history, people lived without refrigerators? Now, people who live without refrigerators and freezers, they find all sorts of methods for preserving food. We've kind of lost this a little bit in our culture, I think, with fridges and freezers. And one of the major ingredients that people use that don't have fridges to preserve things like meat is salt. Salt acts to preserve things, to keep them from going bad. That should sound familiar to you. In the Sermon on the Mount, what does Jesus say to us? He says, you are the salt of the earth. In other words, you act like a preservative against the decay of the world. That's what Christian character of bearing with one another, of forgiving one another, does for our relationships as believers. It preserves it. I think very few things sadden the Lord more than when churches divide over foolish things. When believers divide over foolish things. There are times when division is necessary because Theological error is so great. But most of the time, church conflict happens not over those important things, but over foolish things, silly things, 
And those things happen because we lack Christian character. We lack compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. We need those things to preserve Christian relationship. Every church, no matter how nice the building, this is a beautiful building, I love the building. Every church, no matter how nice the building, no matter how fantastic the music, no matter how good the preaching or anything else, every church needs its members to be growing in Christian character. Without that, the disease of division will cause spiritual rot within the church. Hopefully, we all see how serious this is, and hopefully by now we're all asking the question, how do I make all this work? How do I make Christian character work in my life? And Paul gives us that answer in verse 14. If you want Christian character to work and grow in our life, then we need to understand this. Here's the fourth thing. Christian character only functions in love. Every aspect of Christ-like thoughts, feelings, and actions depend on love. Christian character only functions in love. Look at verse 14 with me. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together, in perfect unity. Undoubtedly, when the Bible speaks of love here, it is speaking of the love of God. You know, when you hear, when you hear unbelievers or when you hear our culture talk about love, don't inject that meaning into what the Bible means when it talks about love. Someone asked Jesus once, what was the greatest commandment? Do you remember what Jesus said? Remember what His response was? The greatest commandment is Matthew twenty two thirty seven. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is why Jonathan Edwards could say that true virtue, true Christian character, is impossible without a love for God. Jesus added to the answer though, right? He gave a second part. He said the greatest commandment is to love God, but then He said the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's much more than simply making an addition to the command to love God. I think Jesus' intention there in putting those two commands together is to say that obedience to the second is a natural outworking of obedience to the first. In other words, the result of loving God will be loving others, your neighbor, as yourself. So if we're to understand and apply this commandment to put on love, we must understand love from God's perspective. Ask yourself a question. Does God's love leave people in their sin? No. What does God's love do? God's love draws people to Himself which is for their highest eternal good. That's what God's love accomplishes is the highest eternal good for people. So with that in mind, I offer this definition of love. I've offered it before. It's worth repeating. That genuine biblical love is a tender-hearted affection which desires the highest good of others. Love speaks and it acts towards others with a desire for them to know and enjoy God more every day and into eternity. That's what it means to love someone in the kind of love that's being talked about in this verse. Without that, without a tender-hearted affection for the highest eternal good of others, people will never display the kind of compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness or patience that we're called to here as we're called to put on Christian character. At best, we may seek them in some kind of dispassionate way out of a sense of duty because we know that's what we're supposed to do, but it will have very little practical effect in our life if we don't have love. Love is to Christian character what a fan belt or a serpentine belt is to a car. 
Have you ever opened up the hood of your car recently? Some people. If you've ever looked under the hood of your car, you'll notice that there are a number of pulleys in underneath the hood. And there's a pulley for the water pump, there's a pulley for the alternator, there's a pulley for the air conditioning compressor, and there's a, a few other things as well. And when the engine is running, there's a, there's a pulley that's being driven, and around that pulley there's a belt that goes to all of these other pulleys that makes them spin all together and makes them work all together. If that belt breaks or is missing, your car will not last long. It binds them all together. It causes them all to work together. That's what biblical, that's what biblical love does for Christian character. It causes each aspect to work, to work in unity with the other aspects of Christian character. When love is absent, so is Christian character. Now the good news for us here is that if we genuinely believe the gospel of salvation by faith alone in the person and work of Jesus Christ, then we are the object of God's infinite love. This goes back to point one, right? Christian identity. Did you catch that at the end of or the middle of verse 12? You are dearly loved as those who are chosen and holy in Christ. We're the objects of God's infinite love. Now think about this. There is an infinite supply being poured out or filling a finite container. God's infinite love is being poured out into the heart of a regular human being like you and me. A finite container. Now what happens when an infinite source is being poured into a finite container? What happens? The container overflows. That's what happens. What that means then is that the primary way we are to put on love is to remind ourselves of the love that God has for us in Christ. The reason why we often don't give love or have enough love to give to others is because we don't feel loved. Right? No Christian should ever feel that way. You have the infinite love of Almighty God being poured into your heart for the sake of His Son every moment of every day into eternity. And if we really believe that we are the undeserving objects, and we are the undeserving objects of God's love, we'll be compassionate. And we'll be kind. Few things are more humbling to my mind than the unmerited love of God in Christ. In my most sober moments, when I ask the question, why does God love me? There's not a single reason that I come up with that comes from me. Not a single one. You want to be humbled? Think about the unmerited love of God. He loves you for the sake of His glory, not because of anything you are. That's humbling. Brothers and sisters, you want to be humble, you need to know the love of God. When we're confident in the love of our sovereign, almighty God, gentleness and patience will mark our way because we know that God is watching over absolutely everything. How can I remain calm in the Christmas lineups in Costco? It's insane what that store is like. But when I remind myself that the sovereign God of the universe orders everything in my life, I can be calm. And I can be patient. We need Christian character, brothers and sisters. And can I say this in the most loving way? We need it in our church. We need Christian character. It's impossible. It's impossible to be a Christian without it. How can you fight against sin? 
if you're not taking on Christian character. You can't. How, how do you live the Christian life without Christian character? You don't. It's what keeps us fighting against sin. It's what keeps us together as believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ. And all of it is the result of God's infinite love. May God be gracious to us and make us more like Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, I see the beauty and the glory of the character of Your Son in these, in these traits that You command us to take up and put on as Your people. These are glorious and wonderful thoughts. Oh Lord, I think about what fellowship in heaven must be like when every sin has been put to death and these character traits of gentleness and kindness and humility are fully part of who we are completely apart from sin. What a glorious thought. Oh God. God, I thank You for all the people who name the name of Jesus here this morning. I thank You for their faith in Christ. I thank You for choosing them and setting them apart for Yourself. And God, I pray that You would build these things into our life so that we might enjoy our salvation more and bring more glory to Jesus. For it's in His name that I ask these things. Amen.